know when they hand the youth pastor the microphone, you guys are in trouble. <laughs> half, the youth, half the leadership team of this church is uh, at a wedding ceremony, so best believe that Joe is covering this uh, service with prayer. It's good to be here, though. It's good to be here. My wife spoke uh, yesterday, and just, not yesterday, sorry, last Sunday, and shared um, our journey of being foster parents, and uh, I won't go into that, that journey, but I want to talk to you guys about Acts chapter 21. Oh, man, this is good. This is good. If, if I'm a movie, I, I like movies. My wife got me into movies. My favorite movies is the Lord of the Rings movies. In Acts chapter 21, that's when, that's when the pot is starting to boil over, right? That's when you've got, you've got Sam and Frodo, and they're looking at the volcano, and the only thing that stands between them is the city of orcs. This is the, this is the point. Acts chapter 21 is the point where the cowards, they turn away, and they run, and the heroes march on. Acts chapter 21. I am excited to speak about this. <laughs> Man, okay. So, let me just set the stage for you. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. And he's stopping off at these towns and these cities on his way to Jerusalem. And he's seeking out the believers there in these communities. And he's just having fellowship with them on, his, you know, on the journey. And they're asking him, Paul, where are you heading off to? He's, he's telling these believers, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. They're saying, whoa, <laughs> no, no, Jerusalem, that's, that place is hostile to the gospel right now. You don't want to go there, Paul. You will, be, you will be persecuted. And Paul is, well, let's just, let's just read it. He's, so we're going to start off in verse 4. He's in this uh, town called Tyre. Verse 4, it says, we sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Now, it kind of looked like to me that it was saying that maybe Paul was out of step with the Holy Spirit here. And maybe the believers that were trying to convince Paul not to go to Jerusalem, maybe they were the ones who had it right. I did a little bit more digging. And what's, let me explain what's really going on here. Is you have the Holy Spirit revealing to Paul and revealing to these believers that if Paul goes to Jerusalem, there will be persecution. And so these believers in Tyre are saying, therefore, you should not go to Jerusalem. And Paul is saying, oh no, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. You see, he's preparing me for the hardships. He's not wanting me to turn from the hardships. We need to be careful that we're we, we, we need to have our, our eyes focused on God's will and not follow good people with good intentions. When somebody comes up to you and says, I've, I've got a word from God for you, and they start sharing something that maybe some are, don't, don't ruin my moment, little girl. I changed your diaper. <laughs> I'm just kidding. When, uh, when, uh, when somebody comes up to you and, and they say, hey, God has revealed to me something and, and I, I need to share it with you. And they start speaking to you about a decision that you haven't shared with anybody. And, and they're giving you direction. You, you could say, okay, hey, thank you, God, for, for revealing that to me. But if somebody comes up to you and just shares this idea out of left field, you go, hold on a second. Where did that come from? You see, when God sends somebody to confirm something to you, it's affirmation, it's not revelation, it's not something new, okay? It's something, it's a problem or, or a decision that maybe you are dealing with in the moment. So if somebody comes up to you and gives you this, this idea, this word from God, I want you to take that idea, stick it in your pocket, right? Go to your prayer room or wherever it is that you feel most connected to God. Pull out that idea and say, God, what do you want me to do with this? Is this something that you're about to speak to me or 
or what's going on here. But know that people make mistakes. Sometimes Christians with good intentions, they think they hear from the Lord, but they just they drop the ball and it's just an honest mistake. Don't sell all your possessions and you know do whatever it is that they are suggesting that is from the God from, from the Lord. But take it in prayer. There's two exceptions here. One is if what they are saying to you goes directly against what God has already revealed in his word. Anybody says any, anything like that, you, you can just dis, disregard it. The other exception is for you single ladies. Because there are too many men out there who are using the God told me card as more of a pickup line than, <laughs> than anything else. Hey girl, God revealed to me that you and I are made to be. <laughs> you look at that boy, you say, get behind me, Satan. And you turn and you run as fast as your feet will take. Do not mess with that fire. I better sit with my notes here, man. I... <laughs> Let's jump down to verse 12 through 14. See, Paul, <laughs> Paul is now in a town called Caesarea in verse 14, or verse 12, rather. And there's this prophet that visited him where he was staying with these believers. And they're saying, this prophet says, hey, Paul, give me your belt. He takes Paul's belt. He wraps his arms and his legs. And he says, the owner of this belt, if he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be bound up like this, unable to move his arms and his legs. And man, <laughs> that's not intimidating. So verse 12 says, when we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. <laughs> Paul was all in. I remember being a newlywed. <laughs> I remember the first place we got Canyon Creek Apartments in Wilsonville. It seemed like half the people we met in Wilsonville lived in these apartments. This was a huge apartment complex. And we lived in the very back tucked in corner. You remember that day? Oh man, it was terrible. Because in between our parking spot to the road was speed bumps and signs that reminded you, hey, this, this area, five miles per hour. <laughs> it took forever to get to the road. You're shaking your head like, yeah, you remember. <laughs> I remember one time we were driving to church and we were already late. Man, I, I hated being late. I'm used to it now. I've been married almost six years. I'm used to it. <laughs> but at this point in my life, you know, I, I hated being late. And my wife, and I, I, I see the road. I see the road. And my wife says, oh, I forgot something. <laughs> I don't care if you forgot your cell phone. I don't care if you forgot your purse. I am not turning this car around. No way, no way. She looks at me and she says, I forgot to take my birth control. <laughs> man, I flipped that vehicle around so fast, we got whiplash, man. <laughs> You've never seen a car flip around that fast, man. <laughs> What fear, what threat, what price can get you to turn the car around 
and away from God's calling on your life. See, Paul, he was all in. And not even death could shake him. I want to... I'm a youth pastor, so I always try to give the youth group the why. Okay, because anybody younger than me, it just seems like that's the question, right? Why, why, why? <laughs> it gets really annoying, but it's actually challenging me to actually look into these things. Why? Why was Paul this motivated to follow the call? I mean, he could have done work at other places where he maybe not get beaten up or killed or bound and would have done good work from the Lord, right? Why Jerusalem, Paul? My grandma, she's she's got Alzheimer's. And uh, <clears throat> it's really affecting her. I remember I drove down to Medford and I was visiting with her. And I see this, this puzzle that she was working on. 1,000 piece puzzle that she began to work on just to you know, help keep her mind as sharp as it could be. And I noticed that there was, you know, you, you work on the edges first, right? I noticed that there was an edge piece that was missing. And I, I kind of, you know, my wife and I, we kept we looked all around for this edge piece, and it, and it was just gone, right? It's just it's gone. And I'm flipping over furniture. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> there's the, there, because there is nothing worse than finishing a puzzle that has a missing piece, right? Because when you see the, the, the finished work, it doesn't matter how beautiful the picture is. I don't know about you, but my eyes, they just divert right to that missing piece and go, oh, well, that was a big waste of time. <laughs> and I visited her a couple months later. She was still working on the puzzle, but it was almost done, right? But you could see sections that were all finished except for one piece missing. So there was like three or four pieces that were just gone. I said, Grandma, what are you doing with the puzzle pieces, man? A couple months later, I visit her again. And I see this puzzle hung up on the wall. And I'm like, wow. I'm saying all the pieces are there. I said, Grandpa, Grandpa, what? where did you find the pieces? I was turning furniture over looking for these pieces. Where, where did you find them? And my grandpa, he, he says this. He says, I, I took some paper, put it under the puzzle, and I took some paint, and I just painted in the colors that were missing. And now when you look at the puzzle, it doesn't matter how close you get to the puzzle, you can't tell what pieces are missing. My past should have messed up my future. It should have messed up my today. And a lot of the things that should should have caught up to me, you know, a lot of them are my own decisions. A lot of them are things that were out of my control. And if you if you looked at my life like a big puzzle you would see these missing pieces, right? But I've just been on this journey where I just allow the hand of God to paint in the missing colors of my life. And now it's like people, people that I went to school with, people that knew the things that I used to be about, they, 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 they almost laugh about it. Well, you you preaching on Sunday? Oh, you're a preacher boy now, huh? <laughs> like, but people they don't 
they don't see the missing puzzle pieces. And I, I still, you know, I'm still, I'm still in that process of sanctification, of, of getting things worked out. But man, it feels so good to feel the hand of God just painting these pieces that are missing in your life. Would you allow God to paint in the puzzles of your life? The missing pieces. I don't know what it is that ripped pieces out of your puzzle. Maybe your parents divorced. Maybe you gave your sexual purity to somebody that promised you forever. Maybe you lost a loved one. And just as the thing, it just the pieces, they just go missing. And now you're like, I, I'm, I'm just a walking puzzle that's missing pieces and people are gonna, they're not gonna see my beauty, they're just, their eyes are gonna be, they're just, they're just gonna notice the missing pieces. Will you just let the hand of God just paint in? And then when, when that healing, when that restoration happens and people are saying, Wow, you just look like a complete person, like you have it all together. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. There's some pieces missing. It doesn't matter how close you get up to my life, you're not going to notice what pieces are missing, but there are pieces missing. But that is a testament to what God can do in my life. That's a testament to what God can do in your life. And Paul looked at this community, the city of Jerusalem, and he saw a culture, a community riddled with missing pieces. And he was all in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them the gospel. I know the one who paints those pieces together. I know the one who, who, who brings salvation. And I'm going to go, and I'm going to preach, and even if it leads me to my death. Okay, worship team, you better come up here and kick me out of here. <laughs> you know, my cousin and I were talking last year, December or something. We're talking about the eclipse, and, <laughs> and he says to me, man, the, the total solar eclipse must have been the most beautiful thing you ever seen last year, and I, I told him, no, you know what the coolest thing I ever saw last year, my 2017, the coolest thing that I got to see. see my dad get baptized. Will you excuse me for a moment? Christ into his life and not only just 
you know, if you just break down life and you just break it down into a bunch of just puzzle pieces. I have just watched the hand of God just work, painting those missing colors. And I go, oh my goodness. No, no, no. You... God is at work. I love it. He's being asked to preach at churches now. <laughs> and he inspires me. I've been a Christian half my life, and he's been, how long have you been a Christian? Like a year or a couple, maybe, I don't know. For real? You, know, you started me on the journey, helped start me on this journey, so it's been a while for me to accept. But we just talked about this with my wife, and I said, I'm all in just the other day, just like you're talking about. Be all in. Thank you, Dad. And thank you, Daddy. You've got an amazing wife. Proud to call her my, my uh, stepmom. Almost called her my mother in law. That would have been very weird. <laughs> I'm a little bitter he hasn't given me his metabolism, but I mean, I'm a little bitter. <laughs> Jesus' name. We can't go without you. 